It was 1845. A blight descended upon Ireland. A million potato plants, the lifeblood of the nation, turned black and putrid. Over the next seven years, this famine would devastate the Emerald Isle. With nearly a third of the population relying solely on the potato for survival, starvation became the norm. By 1852, a million people had lost their lives, and a staggering two million Irish men, women, and children were forced to make a choice that would change history. They crammed onto disease-ridden coffin ships and sailed across an ocean, hoping to find a better life on distant American shores. But what awaited them was hardly much better, so they headed west yet again. This is what life was like for the Irish on the American frontier. The Scots-Irish Some of those indentured servants were the Scots-Irish. The Scots-Irish were quite instrumental in opening up and settling the American frontier and western territories. Over the course of the 18th century, hundreds of thousands of Scots-Irish immigrants poured through the Appalachian Mountain regions, moving into the wilderness areas of the backcountry south and beyond. The Scots-Irish descended from Scottish and Ulster Scottish Presbyterians, who migrated to America in the 1600s to 1700s, fleeing religious persecution and seeking economic opportunity. Their ancestors were lowland Scots who had fought for Scottish independence from England under leaders like William Wallace and Robert the Bruce. They were all about freedom though, liberty and individualism. Basically, they were Americans before American was even a thing. This made the Scots-Irish quite well suited for life on the frontier descending from Scottish borderers, clans living along the English-Scottish border who were known for their wildness and lawlessness, the Scots-Irish brought that same daring anti-authoritarian mindset to the American wilderness. As they migrated westward, the Scots-Irish established many of the first permanent settlements on the frontiers, taking their chances in an untamed land. Places like East Kentucky and West Virginia became populated with a distinctly independent, self-reliant culture of the Scots-Irish frontiersmen and women. Their legacy carried on as descendants like President Andrew Jackson and James K. Polk spearheaded yet more Western expansion in the 19th century, oftentimes at the expense of the Native Americans who were already settled in those areas. The Bible Riots When many of these Irish refugees made it to the United States, they were met with raised eyebrows. Thirteen colonies were founded mostly by Protestants. Protestants who were fleeing religious persecution in many forms, and Protestants who were crazy enough to cross an ocean to make sure they could practice their faith in the way they wanted. The Irish immigrants coming to the U.S. in the mid-1800s, on the other hand, were Catholic. It was not a good mix. Anti-Catholic sentiment simmered and eventually boiled over. In Philadelphia, public schools started distributing Protestant Bibles, and riots erupted because Irish parents saw it as an attempt to undermine their faith. These became known as the Bible Riots of 1844. Nativists faced off against these newly arrived immigrants in a series of riots over the summer of that year as mobs attacked churches on both sides and nearly a hundred people died. The Fenian Raids You know what? There was another Irish secret society that took hold in the United States, the Fenian Brotherhood. But unlike the Molly Maguires who were allegedly fighting for workers' rights, the Fenians wanted something even loftier, an Ireland independent from Great Britain. From the United States, they set their sights on Canada, which in the 1860s and 70s was a British territory. Their goal? Invade Canada, and by doing that, hopefully pressure the British into considering an independent Ireland. But you know what? That didn't work. While some Fenians might have fantasized about holding Canada hostage, most recognized the impracticality of the whole situation. Their primary goal was to create enough chaos and disruption on British soil, even though that soil was technically Canadian, to make Britain address Irish grievances. From 1866 to 1871, the Fenians launched a series of small-scale armed attacks on Canada. Each attempt was pretty quickly squashed by Canadian forces, but there were still casualties on both sides, and these raids exposed some serious shortcomings in the leadership and structure of the Canadian militia. The poorly equipped and inexperienced soldiers, they didn't stand much of a chance against the Fenian forces, many of whom were battle-hardened veterans of the American Civil War. In June of 1866, the Fenians decided to take a more direct approach and launched an attack across the Niagara River from Buffalo, New York into Fort Erie, Canada, in present-day Ontario. This became known as the Battle of Ridgeway. The Fenians, led by Civil War veteran John O'Neill, quickly captured the undefended town of Fort Erie. They took control of key infrastructure, including the telegraph station and the railway station. They even invaded the local bakery and forced its owner to make them bread to eat. Now, you know when you invade a bakery, usually it's all over except for the baking. 
Major General George T.C. Napier mobilized a large force of militia volunteers, many of whom were hastily assembled and poorly trained. But the Canadians had numbers, and eventually they pushed the Fenians back into the U.S., where they were arrested by American authorities. The raids? Well, they never really amounted to much in terms of serious consideration by the British of Irish independence. But what it did do? It pushed Canadians into shoring up things on their end, and the territory became an official British confederation with the formation of Dominion of Canada in 1867. Francis O'Neill Francis O'Neill, who lived from 1848 to 1936, was a pretty remarkable guy who wore many hats. He was an immigrant. He was a world traveler. He was a Chicago police officer. He was a scholar. He was an author. He was a historian, a musician. Now, these days, he's virtually unknown, but he did make a lasting impact as the Chicago police superintendent from 1901 to 1905 and as a preserver of Irish music and culture. He was born in Ireland during the Potato Famine. The ambitious young O'Neill left at age 16 to work on merchant ships. Eventually, he settled in Chicago after marrying an Irish girl he met on one of his voyages. O'Neill joined the police force in 1873, and he quickly rose through the ranks thanks to his, well, many hats and the fact that he was quite politically savvy. Alongside his policing career, O'Neill loved collecting and performing Irish music. I mean, he was really into it. He'd learned the flute and folk tunes in his Irish childhood, and it stuck with him. He went to crazy lengths to seek out Irish musicians immigrating to America. He would hire them into the police force just to transcribe their music. O'Neill's passion resulted in the largest collection of Irish music ever assembled. Over 3,500 traditional tunes published across eight books after he retired from the police force in 1905. This helped preserve a cultural legacy that was being suppressed and forgotten. Frontier Priests As a wave of Irish immigrants moved west during the gold rush, so did a wave of Irish priests wanting to make sure that the lawless Wild West wasn't also godless. Hundreds of priests made the treacherous journey out west, and maybe none had more of an impact than a guy named Patrick Minogue. The St. Patrick's Day Parade in Old Sacramento can directly trace its origins to Patrick Minogue. As a man of God, Minogue struck a pretty intimidating image. He was six foot four, 240 pounds, an Irish miner and a priest from County Kilkenny, Ireland. Minogue helped settle the Nevada Territory and later became Sacramento's first bishop. He ministered to miners in Virginia City, kicking them out of saloons on Fridays and making sure they brought their pay home to their wives instead of buying up all the whiskey in the saloon. It earned him the nickname Wyatt Earp with a collar. Minogue built two churches in the area, St. Mary in the mountains in Virginia City in 1868 and the Cathedral of the Blessed Sacrament on K Street in Sacramento in 1887. He also established quite a few Catholic schools, orphanages, and hospitals in the region. He was born on St. Patrick's Day in 1831. Minogue was orphaned as a boy during the Irish potato famine. At 15, he sailed to the United States, working to support his siblings before entering the seminary. A cholera outbreak drove him west to the California gold fields in 1853. After mining to fund his studies, he was ordained in 1861 and sent as the only priest to the booming silver town of Virginia City. That had to be a tough gig. In Virginia City, Minogue recruited nuns to open schools and hospitals while ministering to the rough mining community. Stories abound of his physical interventions, beating a German miner to administer last rites to his Irish wife, riding 180 miles to prevent a man's hanging, and clearing saloons on paydays. His efforts to settle disputes between miners of different backgrounds earned him a ton of respect out west. Minogue died of diabetes on Ash Wednesday, 1895. Literally, he was a towering figure, and an obituary in a local Sacramento paper stated that even the Indians looked to him for protection. In time of need, they never appealed to him in vain. Irish and the Native Americans Native Americans have been through cycles of battles and unfortunately many have lost their lives. The thing is, though, there are actually quite a few positive accounts of interactions between Native American tribes and the Irish on the American frontier. One of the most surprising came from the Choctaw. Just a few years after they were marched from their lands during the Trail of Tears, members of the Choctaw Nation learned of the tragedy unfolding in Ireland during the Potato Famine. They ended up sending $170 to help with the relief efforts across the pond. That money these days would be like thousands of dollars, and all while facing horrible oppression themselves. Several other tribes followed suit, including the Cherokee Nation, which raised $200 for the Irish affected by the famine. The Choctaw Nation's donation to eight Irish famine victims in 1847 revealed a surprising connection between indigenous communities and the Irish based on a shared experience of colonialism. This 
kindred spirits relationship manifested in symbolic ways, like the 2017 unveiling of a stainless steel sculpture in County Cork honoring the Choctaw's generosity during the famine. The bond went beyond symbolism, too. In 1919, during Ireland's War of Independence, Irish President Amon de Valera traveled to Wisconsin to appeal for support from the Ojibwe people. He was made an honorary chief. He spoke to them in Gaelic to highlight their cultural oppression by the English, and the Ojibwe reciprocated by gifting de Valera a ceremonial headdress and 38 caliber guns. But the flip side of the story cannot be ignored. It wasn't all peace and love between the Irish and Native Americans. Let's just keep it 100. One of the first people to find oil in Los Angeles was a guy named Edward Doheny. Doheny was not a nice guy. He earned the nickname Indian Killer as he exploited indigenous lands and made his fortune through the suffering of others. Indentured Servitude After the Battle of Kinsale in 1601, the English began a policy of capturing Irish people and selling them into slavery in the British colonies. Irish prisoners were rounded up and sold to planters in the West Indies, also in Virginia and in New England. Over the next several decades, tens of thousands of Irish men, women, and children were forcibly transported and sold into servitude in the American colonies. One of the most disastrous events in Ireland that led to the situation included the Irish Confederate Wars from 1641 to 1652, where more than half a million Irish lost their lives and some 300,000 were sold into slavery. For over 200 years, from the early 1600s until 1839, the English government actively participated in and facilitated the widespread enslavement of the Irish. Official policies and laws were enacted to forcibly transport Irish men, women, and children to be sold to planters abroad. Except here's the thing, they weren't really slaves, they were indentured servants. This was a whole lot different than the enslavement of hundreds of thousands of Africans that was going on at the same time. Indentured servants were people required to complete unpaid labor for a contracted period. Many indentured servants in the British colonies were working class white immigrants, including thousands of Irish people who were often treated horribly by their masters. But indentured servants were also still considered human beings under the law. The San Patricio Battalion Two years later, a war broke out between the United States and Mexico. The U.S. government actively recruited Irish immigrants to fight. This presented an opportunity for the Irish to demonstrate their patriotism and potentially gain acceptance as citizens despite all the hate being directed towards them. Thousands of immigrants, some veterans of European wars, answered the call. The U.S. Army formed the All-Irish 66th Infantry Regiment, unofficially known as the St. Patrick's Battalion in honor of their patron saint. But the thing was, almost all the officers in the army were Protestants, and many Irish Catholics, well, they were forced to attend Protestant masses before and after battles. They probably didn't like that a lot. Some were contemplating moving to Mexico with its majority Catholic population, a population of immigrants themselves, by the way. I mean, the U.S. wasn't fighting the Aztecs. The Mexicans realized this, and General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana sent out a declaration for the Irish in America that said, in part, the Mexican nation only looks upon you as some deceived foreigners. Can you fight by the side of those who put fire to your temples in Boston and Philadelphia? If you are Catholics, the same as we, if you follow the doctrines of our Savior, why are you seen, sword in hand, murdering your brethren? You know what? The call worked. An Irish immigrant named John Riley, who trained at West Point, busted out his Duolingo app and wound up defecting while fighting for the Americans in Texas and formed the St. Patrick's Battalion, or the San Patricios. As the war progressed, the San Patricios ranks grew to around 200 men. They fought in several major battles, fighting fiercely against the American forces, even though they were badly outnumbered in many of the engagements. Their banner featured Irish symbols along with the words, Freedom for the Mexican Republic. But it didn't last long. After their capture at the Battle of Churubusco in August of 1847, dozens of soldiers from St. Patrick's Battalion were hanged, while others were whipped and branded and just generally mistreated. John Riley, well, he avoided execution but was viciously flogged on orders from an American general named Winfield Scott. The San Patricios who survived were released after the 1848 Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo ended the war. Some remain in Mexico's military, others returned to Europe. In Mexico today, these men are celebrated as heroes and martyrs with parades and memorials honoring their role fighting against the unjust American invasion. Irish Outlaws so in the late 1800s, the coal mining region of Schuylkill County, Pennsylvania was plagued by a spree of violence blamed on a secret society of Irish immigrant miners known as the Molly Maguires. This group emerged from a legacy of Irish rule secret societies that used violence to protest horrible working conditions and evictions by landlords. 
During the Great Potato Famine, over a million Irish immigrated to America, and a lot of them wound up settling in the Pennsylvania coal region to work in the mines. The Irish Catholic miners faced a lot of discrimination. A lot. And a lot of them were forced to take some of the most dangerous mining jobs. They lived in company-owned housing, they shopped at company stores, and saw company doctors, basically owned in every way by the mining companies. When the Civil War kicked off and miners were drafted, resentment grew against what they saw as a rich man's war. As conditions worsened in the 1870s, violence by the Molly Maguires escalated. 24 mine foremen were taken out, hitman style. But was it the Molly Maguires committing the crimes? The history, it seems, is as shadowy as the secret society itself. In 1873, the president of the Reading Railroad hired the Pinkerton Detective Agency to infiltrate and destroy the Molly Maguires, whose union activities were cutting into their profits. An undercover Pinkerton agent named James McParland spent over two years earning the miners' trust while gathering information. But you know what, here's the deal. Despite a clear conflict of interest, the railroad president, Franklin B. Gowan, served as chief prosecutor in the trials. What in the entire... Based heavily on McParland's testimony, 20 men were sentenced to death, with 10 executed on what became known as Black Thursday in 1877. Now, it's still debated whether or not the Molly Maguires even existed in Pennsylvania. Their little shadowy presence still has never been proven conclusively. But still, most historians agree the trials were a travesty of justice, regardless of who exactly was behind the hits. The Poet Scout One of those Scots-Irish frontiersmen was a guy named Jack Crawford. And the Irish immigrant may have had as big a hand as any in creating the romantic portrayal of the Wild West, and was more influential than just about anyone, Buffalo Bill included. Crawford and his father joined the Union Army during the Civil War, serving in the 48th Pennsylvania Volunteers. The young Crawford was wounded four times, and while he was healing after the last one, a nun taught him how to read and write. After the war ended, he returned to Pennsylvania, where he married and started a family. After serving in the 1874 Custer Expedition to the Black Hills of the South Dakota Territory, Crawford settled in the area and reported on conditions in the region for the Omaha Daily Bee. He also became Chief of Scouts for the Black Hills Rangers. After Custer's defeat at the Battle of the Little Bighorn in 1876, Crawford joined the 5th Cavalry, urged on by his friend William F. Cody, better known as Buffalo Bill. In the fall of 1876, he joined Cody's theatrical troupe for the winter season and starred as Captain Jack opposite Buffalo Bill in the Western melodramas that would become really, really, really famous. In spring 1878, Crawford journeyed to the gold fields of the Caribou region in British Columbia, but didn't have much luck as a miner. Now, a year later, he traveled to San Francisco to negotiate the publication of his first book, The Poet Scout, and then scouted for the U.S. Army in New Mexico for their campaign against the Apache. Crawford liked the area so much that he stayed there after resigning from the Army in 1880. He became a post trader at isolated Fort Craig, where his family ended up living for nearly two decades, even after the troops withdrew and the fort closed. Now, Crawford continued to prospect, perform, and write. The Poet Scout was enlarged and reprinted in 1886, followed by three other books, a bunch of plays in which he took the central roles, and more than a hundred short stories. And because of a promise he made to his mother, Crawford reportedly never touched a drop of whiskey. He was so proud of his sobriety that eventually he became a special agent of the Justice Department under President William Henry Harrison. He was responsible for the capture of outlaws and bootleggers who sold whiskey to Native Americans throughout the Southwest. Nellie Cashman Nellie Cashman was an all-around American frontier baddie. The life of this Irish immigrant from Cork County reads like something straight out of a Buffalo Bill play. She met Ulysses S. Grant, she set up housing for gold prospectors, organized a rescue mission for miners stuck in a snowstorm, rescued mine owners from angry mobs, and eventually owned nearly a dozen mines in Alaska, while at the same time becoming the first woman to cast a vote there, even though it was technically still illegal. She was born in Ireland in 1845. Nellie Cashman immigrated with her family to the U.S. during the Potato Famine. After moving around the country, she headed west on the advice of none other than Ulysses S. Grant, taking her first job as a cook in Nevada mining camps. Nellie saved her money, and with that money she opened a boarding house in Nevada in 1872, becoming one of the first female entrepreneurs in the West. She was known for her generosity, often feeding and housing miners who couldn't pay. Her travels took her to British Columbia's Cassiar Mountains in 1874. While there, she heard that 26 miners were trapped in an avalanche nearby, so she organized and led a daring rescue, saving every last one of them. 
1879, Nellie moved to the boomtown of Tombstone, Arizona. I know you heard of Tombstone. That's where she opened a couple of restaurants and continued her philanthropy. She raised money to build a Catholic church and continued to provide aid to minors who wouldn't have any other options otherwise. In December of 1883, five killers committed a robbery in Bisbee, Arizona. When the men were captured and sentenced to hang a tombstone in March of 1884, the town turned into a carnival. An enterprising businessman even built bleachers around the gallows so he could sell more tickets. Nellie was outraged by all this. I mean, she really didn't like this. She felt that no death should be treated as entertainment. She ended up befriending the five condemned men, visiting them and giving them spiritual guidance. Nellie pleaded with the sheriff to place a curfew on the town for the executions, which he did, preventing most spectators from watching. Now, after the men were executed and buried in Tombstone's Boot Hill Cemetery, Nellie found out about a plan to rob their graves so their bodies could be used at a medical school. Now, she didn't like that at all, so she hired two prospectors to guard the graves for 10 days, making sure the bodies remained undisturbed. Her exploits would earn her the nickname Angel of Tombstone. In 1898, Nellie moved up to Alaska when the Klondike Gold Rush hit, and within a few years, she had 11 mining claims. In 1912, she might have just been the first woman in the U.S. to vote when she voted for Alaskan statehood, although it's unclear whether or not her vote counted, since women still didn't have the right. Old Smoke New York City in the mid-1800s may not have been out west, but it was definitely its own version of the Wild West. It was a place of lawlessness, where gangs ran amok, crooked police pocketed bribes more frequently than horses relieved themselves in the streets, and where immigrants could rise through the ranks and become leaders. One of the most notorious was an Irish immigrant named John Old Smoke Morrissey. Morrissey moved to upstate New York with his parents when he was just a few years old, and when he came of age, he moved to New York City and joined the Dead Rabbits. That was one of the most powerful gangs in the city. He was a big fella too, a towering man. Morrissey soon distinguished himself during the gang's brutal street fights, and eventually he figured, you know what, I need to get paid for what I'm good at. So he became a professional prize fighter. During a bare knuckle fight in the basement of a New York hotel early in his career, the scene took a wild turn when a stove was overturned, spilling hot coals all over the floor. But Morrissey and his opponent Tom McCann continued beating each other senseless amidst the burning embers. There was one point where McCann knocked Morrissey down onto the scorching coals, burning his back and causing smoke to rise from his smoldering skin. Morrissey's friends tried to douse the flames with cold water, but he simply got back up in a blind rage, his back still smoking, and he battered McCann senseless. I mean, he beat the brakes off of him. That bit of madness earned Morrissey the nickname Old Smoke. In 1853, he won the Bare Knuckle Boxing Championship of America in a chaotic 37-round bout against a guy named Yankee Sullivan and was only awarded the victory when Sullivan failed to answer the bell after a ringside brawl. Morrissey's greatest rivalry, though, was with the nativist gang leader William Bill the Butcher Poole, who lost money betting against him. In 1854, Poole defeated Morrissey in a brutal match, but the following year, Morrissey ordered two Dead Rabbits members to fatally wound Poole in the leg after a brawl avenging his loss. Morrissey became a hero to the Irish community. Morrissey was rewarded by Tammany Hall, the powerful democratic political machine that essentially controlled New York City politics throughout much of the 19th century. By this time, his net worth was somewhere around $200,000, which is about $5 million today. Morrissey was elected twice to Congress as a Democrat and testified against corrupt Tammany Hall boss William Tweed. Thanks for watching Nutty History. If you love this kind of frontier content, like and share the video with someone who would love it too. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button and ring that bell to keep up to date with all the videos about the nutty side of human history.